Hello everyone, it's Tuesday the uh, 2nd of April, I had to check my, my watch, it is Tuesday isn't it guys, we're, we're not at Sunday yet, I can't no. just fast forward to Sunday, <laughs> I, I'm certainly feeling a bit like that, I just want to advance through the week but there's a hell of a lot of talking to be done between now and kick off, we're going to fill that void with uh, 30 minutes or so of conversation, Tony's on and Kevin's on as well, Kevin how are things? Yeah very good, looking forward to Sunday. Hamish, yep, bring it on. I think that's the, I think that's the feeling, isn't it? Now we be feeling a lot better about uh, yourselves and the team going into Sunday. So yeah, bring it on, as you said. Are you guys generally like? Do you have a positive mindset going into these games, or do you fear the worst, or does it depend on the state of play? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I've got well. My uh, my dad always had a theory about this, so he had um, so throughout the first nine in a row in Lisbon and all the European glory when Celtic went just the best team in Scotland or the UK, but one of the top five in Europe. Rangers always had a very good team. Then a lot of people forget that that you know in order for Celtic to win that domestic success, they had to overcome a really good Rangers team. And my dad said that no Celtic supporters he ever knew um, went into these games thinking they could win. He always felt Celtic had an inferiority complex. And, and Rangers fans, no matter how well Celtic were playing or whether they just you know knocked out um, Dukla Prague, won a European Cup, beating Red Star, Belgrade, Leeds United, etc., that they... <laughs> To him, it always seemed that that they and their kind of backers in the the Scottish media had had this kind of overweening confidence. But I I I kind of still have you. You've got to have apprehension when you play Rangers. The only time, the only couple of years where I had next to no apprehension with playing Rangers was in Brendan Rodgers' first couple of seasons when we were knocking four and five past them routinely. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, uh, Philip Clement has has made Rangers better, and and yeah, it will be close. But I don't. I'm 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 quietly confident about uh, Sunday. I think uh, player for player, we have a better team. We've got a better bench. When they play well, uh, we will win. They play at the top of their game against Rangers playing at the top of their game, Celtic win. Um, as for home advantage at Ibrox with no fans, Celtic have no fears there either because Celtic perform very well um, at Ibrox under the most testing circumstances. They've stood up to it um, and they've flourished. They, they, they win. They've had a couple of decent draws and the only time that they were outplayed um, was in a, a game of no consequence. Um, and the, the same can't be said for Rangers when, when they've come to Celtic Park in uh, similar circumstances. So it all hinges, I think, for me on whether Callum McGregor starts. Um, we would, you know, be a, it would be a blow to There's no, There's no two ways about it. If he doesn't start, it's a blow to us. However, the midfield um, in recent games, as we saw against Livingston, has begun to click. Uh, there is competition for places on the right. Um, uh, Kuhn, our big money signing and transfer, is showing up and looking at every inch the player that you know we had been told he was. So I'm I'm in a better place going into this game than if it had occurred a couple of months ago. Hundred percent. I feel the same way. Um, I, I'm never confident, even in the Brendan Rodgers days. I would find a way to worry about you know the things things going wrong. Um, but yeah, so much to chat about. Listen, first of all, just take a wee quick break um, and thank uh, Weissman, who are uh, a global leader in the boiler industry, known for their top notch German engineering for uh, sponsoring this podcast. Um, they've teamed up with Scotland's very own award-winning installation team, MPH Boilers, who we all know well, making this a perfect match right here in Scotland. Weissman's Boilers are engineered to deliver not just warmth, but unparalleled efficiency and reliability. We're talking about cutting-edge technology that's designed to save you on energy bills and reduce emissions. 
And with MPH Boilers, you know you're getting service from the best in the business, a local team that's committed to excellence and customer satisfaction. As part of this incredible partnership, when you choose a Weissman Boiler installed by MPH Boiler, you also get a free internet controller, uh, plus they're offering the first year service free. So if your boiler is shown its age, or you're considering an upgrade, this is your chance to get world-class engineering with local expert service from Weissman and MPH Boilers. Uh, Tony? Yep, still running the deal. Six months of access for a pound. Got access to everything that's written on the website. Excellent uptake on this. We can't thank you enough. And uh, they'll be sending the Kyogo Furuhashi artwork by Running Football Artists made by Frankie in due course. We'll keep you informed of that, but just keep hitting that button, guys. That subscribe button www.celticway.co.uk forward slash subscribe. And we thank everybody for that. Yeah, as I say, the uptake's been excellent. We're really chuffed with the numbers, and we're not that far away from a milestone number for it. So, thank you. And as Kevin touched upon there, talking about the midfield, just a by accident and a Mr. Ben style, an article appeared, and there it is. I'm talking about that triumvirate. Uh, in the midfield of Callum McGregor, Rio Atati and Matt O'Reilly. Have a wee read at that, guys, and see what you think. But I think that's key, as the headline says, key to Ibrook's success. I think if all of those three play, I think if all of those three are in the starting team sheet, we'll all smile on Sunday, won't we? Oh. You'll, you'll breathe and relax a wee bit more, won't you? Callum's the one that's touch and go, but what a boost that'll be if... Uh, all of those three play, and that's that's my thinking behind that article. So have a look at it, guys. Yeah, I think you'll enjoy it. I'm pretty sure Cal McGregor's going to start, not based off any information. I just think he's been geared up for this one. I think so too, and I, I, I think reading between the lines, he's, he's it's what he's been primed for, isn't it? Just didn't want to take any unnecessary risk. Get yourself fit for Ibrooks. You're our captain, the leader. You're taking us in there. You know the drill. You've done it before, and I think Kevin, you've made the point before. He's got he's got an unerring ability of stepping up to the plate in Rangers games, hasn't he? Yeah, and yeah, being yeah. The, the best player in the park. He loves these games, um, and I think not only do uh, the players around him um, respond when he's on, because you know it gives them. He's an anchor, and I mean that. Um, yeah, I, I, what do I mean by that? He's, you know, if you're, if you're playing alongside him, you know that he will always be available. If you're in a tight situation, if, uh, you know, you're kind of outgunned in a certain part of the pitch, he'll be in your eye, eye line. You know, he will make himself available. And um, I, I know that there had been some slight criticism, and we saw this during the COVID season, where he was... Um, he was accused of kind of playing the ball too much sideways, but that was much more to do with the fact that there was just there was there wasn't much happening uh, beyond him, and he's you know he plays that continental way. If you can't do anything positive with it, you know, like putting it forward, don't lose possession. And and the, the top continental clubs and in their leagues, that's their number one golden rule. Uh, Scotland are kind of. Fans' mentality is is a, a little bit more edgy. <laughs> so after about seven or eight of these passes, we're kind of right. Come on, you know, get it forward mm -hmm. in the continent. They're much more relaxed about it. And I think in these games uh, against Rangers, um, uh, you know, when, it, when it's important not to give the ball away because you're you're playing against them um, better players than than you normally would. That's the first principle. When you give the ball to Callum McGregor, he either does something positive with it and he very, very rarely gives it away. Um, he dominates that kind of, you know, circumference around, you know, 20 yards behind, 20 yards forward of the halfway line. And and Rangers players, you know, are wary when he when he gets it. They try to kind of close him down, but he kind of alludes his kind of spatial awareness. <clears throat> he can, you know, he can allude uh, his opponents um, in the same way, you know, Hatati does it even better with his back to goal. Um, you know, he, he can receive the ball and turn with it very, very fluidly and turn what is, you know, maybe a haphazard, slow 
build up into one bang pass defence opened up. Um, how much? How often have we have we seen it? Um, so yeah, yeah. Those those two players and Matt O'Reilly showed signs of kind of getting it together again against Livingston. I just wish, <laughs> I just wish when the ball came to him inside penalty areas, he just walloped him a bit more. <laughs> you know, Matt, just don't be afraid to hit it, son. <laughs> Is that including toe bashers, Kevin, as well? Um, yeah. what, I, what I know, you know, what I know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's um, actually, it's just a really exciting midfield. Do you know the last time those three started together, Hatati, McGregor, O'Reilly in the same team, Atletico like Madrid this. home game in October. Oh, was it? That's, right. That's, that's, and Hatati went off after seven minutes. The previous game to that was Tynecastle, the four-one win, and I remember the three of them being brilliant that day, yeah. Tony. Yeah, and and that's what you get, isn't it? I mean, that's that's what we hope for. And I made the point yesterday, and I'll make it again that. I'm not perturbed if McGregor doesn't play and it's Iwata, because I think Iwata's been playing really, really well. If that's the that's the hand we're dealt with, but mm-hmm. I just, for my own peace of mind, would like to see McGregor there, because we're going to win. And as I've said before, those three are offensive and can hurt Rangers. I think I'm not saying Iwata can't, but he's more of a, of a sitter. I'm I'm thinking about going there and making statements, and I think those three guys can go there and make a statement and help it. And Iwata can do that as well. But I think you're inviting Rangers on you yeah. if you're having a, a holding with your or a sitter and you're inviting trouble. Whereas you're asking real questions, you're lining those three up and saying, okay, show us what you got. You know, and plus I, and Kyogo, I, and, plus yeah, Kuhn, and, and, yeah, Maida. An informed Kyogo, Kuhn coming onto a game and Maida being Maida, mixed Brilliant bag Maida as I call him, but he's always good at eye flux. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Scored a wonderful goal uh, in the, that two each game, where he, you know, he took advantage of a slack pass from Tavernier and skinned his mark and put it away brilliantly. And so you're going to need all that. But I, I, I wrote in that piece that that's the three best midfielders in the country, right? McGregor, Hattati and O'Reilly. And you're asking serious questions, Rangers, if you line up with those three and you're and you're starting eleven. And and I think. Uh, Everybody will feel better about themselves, and I just think it, that's that's been the game plan all along, especially in terms of McGregor and Hitati. You know, we always thought Hitati was going to get minutes at Livingston. I mean, he was brilliant for sixty-five minutes, and I know we're talking about the level of opposition, but I'm talking about that standard of pitch as well, which is substandard. And he was still the best player technically mm. on the park, wasn't he? Yeah. The sixty-five minutes he played, Hamish, you said first thing he did was get the ball. Guy, uh, right up, up his you back, know, up his backside. He swivelled and turned and played the ball at wide, and you were just like, "This is if he's never been away." Ryan pointed out the dummy at one point to to Johnston, but every time I saw a try to pick up the ball, he would oceans of space to look into. And and again, I go back to that midfield player who, like McGregor and like O'Reilly, they see it in pictures, don't they? They're, they're two or three steps ahead. So if I do this. Then you're expecting Kyogo to run, you're expecting Kunt to run, you're expecting Maida to, to dart there or O'Reilly to dart in there. Or, you know, so, and I and I think a, a large part of uh, O'Reilly's performance on Sunday was the fact that Hitati was there. He'd somebody tuned into yeah, his yeah. wavelength, right? Tuned into his wavelength, and it functioned really, really well. And you say to yourself, O'Reilly kind of started breathing again and started doing things that come naturally. As you see, maybe he's a wee bit more shot shy, but hey, why not have a screamer at Ibrooks then, you know, if that's the case. But I just think you're just seeing the start of something coming together for this run in and it fills you with optimism, let's put it that way. I've never ever been scared of going to Ibrooks to play Rangers. I just always say that you know, Celtic turn up, they'll get a better team with better players. And if they turn up they win. But myself and Hamish were talking off air and we were saying there's lots of other variables there, Hamish, isn't there? <laughs> the atmosphere having no fans and you know something going wrong early and Celtic not responding to to that. I think Kev made a really good point earlier saying that you know the, the I think all of these players bar Kuhn will have been to Ibrooks and and won. You know, 
some of them a couple of times, certainly at least one without fans. And I think that's that's really important. And they've been behind at Ibrox as well, a number of them, and come back to get draws mm -hmm. and wins. Um, so I think that's really important. For me, that's always always the worry, especially even more so with, with no fans. And thankfully, this is the final one. We'll go to Ibrox, it seems, with no fans. But those early stages of the game, like, can you be sure in everything you do? Because if you give them any... Uh, give that support and that team any kind of sign of weakness or any kind of sign of a lack of concentration or fear, um, they will pounce on it. That That's what it's like. It's the same when they come to Celtic Park. Listen, it's the most hostile environment you can probably go into as a footballer, a Celtic player going to Ibrox, a Rangers player going to Celtic Park. My point being, Tony, I think the best way we deal with that is by going for them right from the start. It's not by playing it calm and being resolute and obviously you try and do those things anyway and I'm not saying you you know you absolutely go you know 10 men from kickoff you know run at the Rangers go or anything daft like that but you give them something to think about you try and quieten down that support by dominating the game dominating the ball and I think that's what we'll, we'll go to do Kevin as well yeah I can recall a couple of occasions in the last two or three seasons where um, but very quickly, uh, we silenced um, the Rangers fans at Ibrox. And it was because, uh, and again, a lot of it was down to McGregor. It was because we were stroking it about quite confidently in the middle of the park. And <clears throat> Rangers just, you know, weren't able to get the ball off. Was, I think one of them was, it was a game we ended up drawing to each because mm -hmm. in the first half for most of that first half um we dominated um i think also when when uh, when we beat them 2-1 and at the end of Ange's first season rangers had gone into the lead and um and then uh there was that that um run by Callum McGregor driving into the right side of their penalty area, you know, um, and the goal uh, came not, not long after, and then Celtic looked quite comfortable. But, but uh, yeah, there were, large, there were large sections of several of these games where Celtic have been able to silence the Rangers crowd. And, I mean, I don't know if it's my imagination or wishful thinking or looking at the game um, differently, but, you know, as a Celtic fan, but but I think um, I think the Rangers fans withdraw their fervour um, much more readily than Celtic fans in adversity. I, I, you know, I'm not saying that they outrightly jeer or boo their own players. They they don't. But they're quite easily um, subdued into near silence if if you know if. Um, if their own players, if it's not all blood and thunder and, and we're knocking it about. And um, I, I, that's actually something I've noticed over several years, that um, they're, they're, they're quite quick to withdraw the fervour or to turn it down if things aren't going great. You can see, you can also see with some of the home European games. And I mean, I might be wrong, an independent observer might say, well, look, see if you were to listen to your own, you might find the same. <laughs> but I don't think so. I don't think so, but I could stand corrected. <clears throat> it probably comes as a result of being second best for, what, the last decade, you know, longer than that, that um, there's always deep down, as good as they've been in recent months, there's always deep down that fear that they won't admit to, that if we turn up and beat them at Ibrox on Sunday, you know, they're back to kind of being where they've been for, for so long mm -hmm. and they'll really be staring down another Celtic title win. Um, obviously, conversely, if, if they win, then they'll be, I think, favourites for the title, probably big favourites as well, if we're honest, guys. That's how how big Sunday is. Um, 1976, Doc, just wanted to bring this up because you know people may, may feel like this. Hattati, not 100% match fit. Cal Mack, not 100% fit. Uh, you're being way too sentimental. This is a game for match fit players. For me, Hatati showed on Sunday that he's ready for Ibrox, um, different opposition, but I think he, he showed that. And we don't know about McGregor. That's the thing. Like We, we don't know. And it was the same with Hatati, guys. We, we spoke for ages and I think 
maybe all four of us on, on the channel last week said that Hatati probably wouldn't start against Livingston and then bang, he was in the starting lineup and he was possibly man of the match. So that shows how much we know about fitness. What I would say that is that um, McGregor has come into these derbies before, Tony, from an injury and has gone yeah. right in and, and absolutely bossed it. So I don't think I have any doubts. Someone else was saying, you know, McGregor, I've not got the comment, but someone was saying McGregor would probably be honest with Brendan Rodgers if he wasn't ready. Yeah. To play. So if McGregor plays, I think he'll, he'll 100% be ready for the match. Going to trust the manager's call. Whatever starting 11 starts at Ibrox, you know, the manager knows best, doesn't he? We, we are talking about what we would like to see happen, and nobody knows the state of Callum McGregor's fitness or, you know, match fitness or, or lack of therein. But, you know, I, I still think that that's. It's been part of the game plan to get him fit for this game because uh, it's crucial and you want to go in with your captain leading the team. Could be wrong in that, and as I said, but I'm not necessarily perturbed about Iwata playing if McGregor misses out. I, I just agree with Kevin. It would be a blow, but it's not. It's not a, you know, the way the team is playing, they're, they're still capable of going there and winning. I just think in terms of those three playing... You know, Celtic can win the game with pace, speed, guile and craft. You know, and those three and then your front three of Maida, Kuhn and Kyogo give you all of that, every bit of that, and that's how the game will be won. Yep, we know Rangers will be robust, for want of a better expression, but you can play through that, and those players, for me, can play through that. And if you do it quickly and at a tempo that Brendan Rodgers always talks about, I think there's joy to be had at Ibrox. Kuhn's an unknown quantity to Rangers. And what I love yeah. about Kuhn is he just attacks. He'll keep going. Whether he loses the ball, goes round his markers, plays it to, he'll, he'll constantly just keep attacking. It's been a long time since I've seen a winger like that. And we're only starting to see uh, Kuhn come to the boil now and, and come to fruition after a indifferent start. But he looks comfortable in his own skin and in the Celtic jersey now. He's had his problems. He told us all about them. So I'm looking forward to see because, you know, Rangers can be got at. You know, Motherwell went to Ibrooks and turned them over 2-1. Hibs went to Ibrooks and scored and made it nervy right at, at the end of the, the first half but then couldn't hold on, you know, to half time, even they conceded. In. But Hibs were breaking through the lines as well and have just a wee bit more... A composure and better execution of the final ball, they would have, you know, they would have probably done better. But so I'm pretty confident that Celtic can go to Ibrox and create with the speed, the craft, and the guile and the pace we have in the team, and just the intelligent, quick thinking, forward thinking players. You know, I, I'm, I'm really confident in that. And I am. Um, I think the manager will set you up in a way that that's what you'll do. Um, I think also that, um, you know, Hamish, you were talking at the start of the programme about, you know, do you ever feel confident, you know, or how confident do you ever feel when mm -hmm. when you play Rangers? Um, I mean, I've got, I've got a bit of a confession to make that I thought that um, the two players in recent seasons, the two Rangers players in recent seasons, they used to give me a bit of fear when they were on their game were Ryan Kent and Alfredo Morelos. And I, you know, I don't care what people say about you know, Manelis only scored one or two goals against us. Much was made of his um, his failure um, in the first 10, 12 games to score against us. But but you know, he 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 was a good player when he was on song. He was strong, robust, held on to the ball well, played other people in, gave centre halves a torrid time. And Kent, you know, who was moody, had the skills and the speed. To cause us problems as he did, and I, I've got to say, it, you know, better the better though Rangers have been under Clement. I don't think they've got players of the quality of those two. You know, I don't think. I, I think those two had something in their armory that that could that could harm Celtic when they were on their game. Um, Rangers fans, I know, have said, yeah, perhaps, but they were they were too moody. And you never knew which one would turn up, and fair enough. But I, I think I don't think they've got anybody who is as good as those two. The other thing, 
I know this might be slightly controversial, given that he's broken the record for um, defenders' goal-scoring feats, um, uh, uh, James Tavernier. Um, he doesn't play well against us all that often. Um, quite a few of our goals and most dangerous attacks have come because he's switched off or he's just, you know, like Maida lately, you know, skins him. Uh, and, you know, he's... he's and, and Rangers fans, I know, have said this as well over several seasons. It doesn't doesn't play well often enough um, against us. And I think Celtic know that. But I know he's one of their bigger goal-scoring threats. You know... Oh, you know <laughs> I, 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 I think uh, that know, def- uh, defensively he's been there to be got at, but he's, yeah. he's, for me, attacking-wise, he's probably their biggest... Yeah, you know. but uh, you see, Maida, this is for Maida. This is why Maida will probably yeah. start. Because... Yeah, I know he kind of drives us nuts with his final ball sometimes, but he tra- he's he's like two players. I've I've seen him both at Celtic Park and uh, and at Ibrox against Rangers, where where when Tavernier comes forward, and he is you know he's a very good attacking fullback, Tavernier, but Maida can match him. Maida can can you know police him when he's coming forward. Um, and at the same time, Maida has the pace to go past him if he's given, you know, the proper service. You wouldn't hear anybody at Celtic rightfully say that about Tavernier. You know, he's a, he's a strong, worthy opponent, and he deserves to be, um, you know, he deserves to be in the, the pantheon of recent Rangers, you know, good players. Um, but you know, Celtic, Celtic, I think can exploit sometimes his lack of pace or he's kind of. You know, lack of awareness when when you know when players are coming in um, off cross balls on the left. It's also for me. I mean, I I agree. You know, from open play, he's clearly a threat. He scored at the weekend from open play. For me, it's the the dead balls are the biggest yeah, yeah. and, and not not giving it. away free, free kicks, free kicks. Daft, free kicks. Yeah. penalties. Well, I remember start. I know penalties are slightly different, but getting and from memory, the one at Celtic Park earlier this season it might have been Narotsky. Um, you know, a bit daft, the one at Celtic Park last season, I want to say maybe Aaron Moy or, or Alistair Johnson, bit daft. Don't give away daft free kicks because, someone again, someone commented earlier, and I totally agree, we have the ability to score great goals against them from open play. We've shown that. All three goals we've scored against them this season have been mm-hmm. belters. Jack Butland's picked three belters out of his net. Their goals, more often than not, well, they might be good goals, are from free kicks, corners, Penalties. We need to watch that. And that's the one thing Tavernier has over Joe Hart. Yeah. He seems to have a hex on him when it comes to free yeah. kicks, doesn't he? Just and, don't give uh, away to free uh, correct, kicks. Correct, Hamish. That's the thing, and I agree with Kevin. I think defensively he can be negligent, but it can be pretty deadly from dead ball situations. And you know you have to hand it to him in that sense because he's put two pillars by Joe Hart, hasn't he? Or two top corners. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and those situations can be avoided. Of course they can. You just don't do anything. You don't dive in. If you're not going to win the ball, be as robust as you can. But uh, you just can't afford that. And these are things I'm sure the manager will be drumming into the Celtic defenders and saying to them, look, you know how good this guy is. His technique's pretty good. You, get, you have to take your hat off to him for that. So, And, uh, and you know, and again, that I think that's... That's a, a tactic that Rangers will use as well. They'll play for that, won't they? Territory. And yeah. And they'll try to get yeah. uh, free kicks in and around your area because Tavernier's, it's one of Tavernier's specialities. And even on Saturday, he scored the cracking goal you know, on the, on the half four. Is he, so he, when he ventures forward, I know Maida can negate him. I interrupt you, Tony. Go on. Got the referee through. Go on. For Sunday. SFA have gone with John Beaton to take charge of the match on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> VAR is Nick Walsh. It's just come through there. I literally just refreshed there to see if it would come through. Assistants are Daniel McFarlane and Doogie Potter. VAR, as I say, Nick Walsh. Assistant VAR, Frank Connor. Fourth official, Willie Collum. So there you go. Thoughts on that, guys? Wow. <laughs> wow. What can you say? You know, you can't <laughs> look. Come on, we've been here before. Every 
every fresh generation of officials, you know, you know, there's always been, there's always two or three. <laughs> um, look, we've beaten Rangers with John Beaton in charge before. Yep. We just need to do it again. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> I'm, a bit, uh, I'm a bit stunned by that, to be honest. I have to say. But, yeah, I couldn't believe it, uh, to be fair. It's on the SFA <laughs> website if anyone wants to. Yeah, April Fool's was yesterday. That would have been a good one. Um, well, for that long, yeah. going out with a bang, is he? <laughs> <laughs> It'll be interesting. Uh, very yeah, interesting. Well, I, 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 would, I was very surprised at that. But well, Let's put it this way. Celtic have complained about that very official. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was the whole crux of the, the disciplinary hearing. So... I think I actually think John Beaton's under more pressure than anybody now in terms of what happens on Sunday. So, you know, as we've we've said before, you know, asking for favours, you're asking for fairness. And uh, so, let's see what what comes to to bear on Sunday with Celtic having the Celtic manager having called him incompetent. Let's see if he can raise his levels on Sunday to being competent. And if he's competent, then if the Celtic players do their job, then, like Kevin said there, Celtic can win this game. Kevin? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't, you know, you you have to watch what you're saying, but... (sighs) Look, I've, I've lived through and watched Celtic through an era when when we had some shocking referees, shocking referees. J.R.P. Gordon. Yeah. Um, Bobby Davidson. IMD Foot, <laughs> The Symes, father and son. Um, you know, Jock Steen. Um had choice words to say. You know, at one point we were dealing with all five of them and they were not good referees and there was an issue. There was a, you know, there, there was footage recently of a game in 1978, if you can ever see it. You know, it's, it defies description. It's astonishing. It was Celtic at Ibrooks. Uh, we'd had a really bad start to the season. J.R.P. Gordon was in charge. Um, there's a clear, clumsy push on Joe Craig, I think, in the Rangers' penalty, or a clear penalty. And uh, J.R.P. Gordon allows the, you know, awards a bye kick and allows it to be taken while there's still half a dozen players in the box. So where the, Red, the Celtic players are protesting this, uh, Play continues, uh, so there's been two bad decisions. One that's apparent to everybody, linesman, official, i.e., playing the free kick, uh, the by kick from inside the box when, when there's half a dozen players in there, and, and Rangers go and score, and they won. And I think Tony might correct me in this. I think just after that, Celtic players were threatening to walk off, yeah. and Jock Steen had to kind of go on and. <laughs> And, uh, and and tell them to behave themselves. So I, I'm 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 not fussed. Look, I'm not fussed. We we have beaten Rangers when when there have been some um, bad decisions against us, and we will do so again. And Brendan Rodgers and Callum McGregor, because he's a good captain, will have prepared the team. For the prospect of any referee, we we can't make him be the focus. Yeah, and and I've got to say, look, see if I'm being fair. You know, we we played big crucial games with him in charge, and there's not been a problem. Well, um, yeah, I, the I, you only know, one I can think of is the Golden handball. He was yeah, there that day, wasn't he? But he the Golden's been getting away with that in loads of games with loads of different referees and and sometimes it's not so much as as we saw was it Robertson that refereed is at Tynecastle the other week. Yeah. So some people were blaming him for these decisions, but it, but it wasn't really. Um 
uh, you know, the VAR in these occasions, um, it's the, you know, the, the responsibility shifts to them. Um, so I, I don't have any fears. If we start getting paranoid between now and Sunday, and the players do, you know, and it's all about the referee, and then you're looking at the kind of psychology, is, is, is the referee going to be wanting to put one over in Celtic because he's been called incompetent, or will he feel more pressure to be more equitable? Who knows? <laughs> we, we won. Leave, yeah. that's, that's all I can say. I'll leave you with this, Hamish. Celt uh, Rangers versus Celtic getting top billing on Sky, isn't it? So it's going to be beamed all over. I'll go all Peter Gabriel then. And the eyes of the world are watching now. Watching now. Leave it at that. <laughs> I, I just think it's um, it just adds a wee bit, wee bit extra to the the game on Sunday. And I think um, you know we've been hearing about Brendan Rodgers recently. He's been clearly been trying to, to you know to foster that siege mentality. We've spoken about it a hell of a lot. That got even easier, I think, for Sunday when you just look at the referee and he just needs to say to the players, you know, given what's going on recently, um, you know, you're you're up against it here. Um, but you're good enough to overcome this, and I still believe Celtic are, are good enough to to overcome everything. But it's um, it's a very interesting appointment. That's all I'm going to say. Right, guys, we're going to head off. Um, Kevin, Tony, thank you very much. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll continue the build up to the derby tomorrow. One final wee shout out for this wonderful deal we've got going. Six months of access for the Celtic Way for one pound, and you get a free Kyogo Furuhashi print from renowned football artists made by Frankie as part of that. Right, thanks everyone. 